TurboTax has experts who can help relieve you from the stress of taxes and file for you so you can do not taxes. With TurboTax, an expert will do your taxes from start to finish, ensuring your taxes are done right, guaranteed, so you can relax. Feels good to be done with your taxes, doesn't it? Come to TurboTax and don't do your taxes. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. Intuit TurboTax, full service products only. Video meeting while expert does your taxes required. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com slash guarantees. I was feeling a little mischievous when I called up Will Aremus at The Washington Post to talk about AI. Hello, Will. Hi, Lizzie. I, um, I want to read something to you, and I want you to see if you can guess what it is. <clears throat> Here we go. The age of automation is upon us, and with it comes both excitement and trepidation. On the one hand, doesn't even say on the one, On one hand, advancements in technology have the potential to revolutionize industries and improve our daily lives in ways we can't even imagine. On the other hand, there are legitimate concerns about the societal and economic impacts of automation, particularly with regards to job displacement and income inequality. Do you want to do you want to take a wild guess what that was? Chat GPT. Chat GPT in the style of Will Aremus. Oh no! That is, wow, that's such an own of my writing style. I'm, <laughs> I can't believe you did that to me. I'm sorry, but I had to. I had to because ChatGPT, the AI-driven chatbot, and other consumer AI products suddenly feel like they're everywhere. Earlier this year, the internet was freaking out about AI art generators like Dolly, Stable Diffusion, and Midjourney. Now, ChatGPT is all the rage. So much so that Microsoft, boring old Microsoft, just plunked billions of dollars into the startup behind it. Despite questions about ethics, responsibility, and just how good this technology is. I did ask it to make a joke about AI as if you were Will Remus. And it said, I'm sorry, I can't make a joke as Will Remus, but I can make a joke about AI. Why did the AI cross the road? Why did the AI cross the road? To get to the other side of the algorithm. It's, I, I'm hoping there's something more there. No, that's it. That's it. That's all <laughs> it that was there. Like... Today on the show, no joke here, big tech wants in on the consumer AI boom. Is that exciting or scary or both? I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. All so you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. Since ChatGPT was released in November, there's been a pretty constant drumbeat of hype around it, from Silicon Valley to journalists to professors testing its capabilities. At UPenn's prestigious Wharton Business School, a BB- on an exam is pretty good. But a computer getting that grade using artificial intelligence is jaw-dropping. It's not perfect, but it's good enough that Microsoft reportedly invested $10 billion into OpenAI, the startup that created it. Though neither company will confirm that number. Consumer AI, the AI that you and I can play with right now online, is clearly valuable in a way that maybe the big tech giants didn't foresee. 
even though they've had divisions working on AI for years. Facebook and Google and a few other companies, including Microsoft, had these research labs where they brought in sort of top academics and top computer programmers, experts in machine learning, to just sort of push the field forward. I mean, it's almost like basic research. It didn't have to be immediately commercialized. They were trying to see what are the frontiers of AI. And then uh, eventually those advances, they figured, would, would trickle down into products that they could commercialize. But commercialization wasn't the immediate goal. And so Google had built these models. There was a, a, a Google language model called BERT. And then now it has a, um, a, a sort of chatbot model called Lambda. Um, it acquired a company in 2014 called DeepMind that does AI. Um, and it would look for ways, uh, as the research labs pushed the field forward, it would look for ways to incorporate that into products. Google Translate uses some of these underlying technologies. Um, the Google Assistant, if you have a Google Home or if you have an Alexa and you talk to it and understands basically what you said and gives a coherent response, you know that's using some of the same technologies that have been developed over the years. But it wasn't really until OpenAI and, and a few other startups started releasing some of these things directly to the public that the industry just got really excited. And they were like, hey, we could do all stuff, sorts of stuff with this right now. Like, why are you hiding this away in academic research labs? Yeah, I kind of think about this as like the inside out and outside in way of, of thinking about AI, right? Like inside out is, as you're describing, like deep inside these companies, these semi-autonomous research labs are working on these refined and very powerful machine learning models. Outside in, a couple of scrappy startups are like, woo, hey, make some weird art, write some funky text. And it feels like that puts the big companies on notice. It really does. When OpenAI released GPT-3, which was uh, sort of the, the predecessor to chat GPT, Google AI people noticed and they were like, whoa, like, hey, they're releasing this stuff. This is really interesting. We should really start focusing on, on these types of language models. GPT-3 was released as an API and you had to like jump through some hoops to get access to it. But when, when chat GPT came out and anybody could sign up to use it, and it started like going viral and capturing people's imagination and people started building startups around it, then that's when Google apparently issued like a code red. They were like, you know, <laughs> we got to catch up here. We've been resting on our laurels as the leader in AI research for years. All of a sudden, this company is potentially leapfrogging us and, you know, getting all the hype and all the attention because it, it released its tool to the public. When I think about something like ChatGPT, it's fun to use, it's fun to test its limits, but companies like Microsoft do not make multi-billion dollar investments just for you and me to waste time on the internet. What do they want? Well, there's, there's two things. I mean, there's the short-term play and there's the long-term play. The short-term play is that you can already find some good commercial uses for these tools. Um, you know, one that's easy to understand is that Microsoft is incorporating some open AI tools into Microsoft Office. So, you know, autocomplete in Word can get a lot smarter. You could presumably have Microsoft Outlook, you know, draft a whole email response for you if you wanted to, and then you could go in and, and edit it, hopefully, because <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's never a good idea to let a machine speak for you. Um, you know, Microsoft Excel already has this tool where you can say analyze spreadsheet and it'll it'll like read your spreadsheet and summarize some of the interesting takeaways. Um, a PowerPoint, uh, you know, there's a feature called Microsoft Designer. You can get AI to, to do some illustrations for your PowerPoint slides. That's like short-term, low-hanging fruit stuff. That doesn't justify $10 billion investment, though. What what they're looking for with a $10 billion investment is, is two other things. One is they're going to sell these tools. They're going to sort of repackage and resell these AI tools to companies. So if you're a big company that wants to 
uh, have a better chatbot to interact with your consumers or wants to have AI write some internal reports for your employees, you can now get that from Microsoft through their Microsoft Azure OpenAI service. So they can make money from their enterprise customers, which is where the real, you know, that's where the real money is from Microsoft. Right. You and I are not money. Companies are money. Exactly, exactly. And then and then there's the long, long-term play, which is there are people in the tech industry who think like, this is the future of tech. This is the future of everything. AI is going to be powering every form of knowledge work in the future. And even if we can't see today exactly what that will look like, it's an existential matter for us to get out in front of this and not get destroyed by it. Perhaps ironically, those existential questions were pondered by the founders of OpenAI. The startup began as a nonprofit with the proclaimed goal of building safe AI. One of its early announcements said it planned to, quote, build value for everyone rather than shareholders. But over the past few years, it's pivoted to some for-profit ventures. It's hard to even describe OpenAI at this juncture because we don't know the terms of its deal with Microsoft. They're not disclosing it. We do know that it's this weird sort of company. So it, so it started out as a nonprofit. And the idea among some of these Silicon Valley tech folks who see AI as the, as the future and potentially like an existential risk to humanity, right? If like the computers get so smart that they, you know, we reach the singularity or whatever. Um, so they started as a nonprofit saying, well, if we can help shape the future of AI, then we can make sure it's safe, right? We can make sure that the robots are built in a way that they don't take over and subjugate us all like in the matrix. And I'm not even, I mean, it sounds no, like- No, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's in their charter documents. They have these very lofty principles. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it sounds almost absurd when I, when I say it out loud, but that's like literally what their mission was when they started. And then along the way, they realized like, well, actually pushing the field of AI forward is super expensive. And it turns out like investors don't want to keep pouring a ton of money into a nonprofit with no chance of a return. I mean, everybody in Silicon Valley espouses these lofty ideals, but they also want to make a a, a buck or a billion, right? (laughs) Here here or there along the way. Um, They're not just in it for the goodness of humanity. So They formed a for-profit subsidiary that would give investors a return. So when somebody like Microsoft put up a billion dollars, which, by the way, they did not in the form of cash, but mostly a billion dollars worth of like computing power because it just takes really expensive computers and and server time to train these models. Um, When they put that up, now they have a chance of actually making back their money, you know, tenfold or 20-fold. And what OpenAI eventually came up with was was a structure they called capped profit, where the for-profit subsidiary can earn a certain level of return. And they've changed this around. It was like 20x or 100x or, you know, repay investors 20 or 100 times what they put in. But if it gets even bigger than that, then the money starts going back into the nonprofit at some point. It's it's an incredibly complicated arrangement. Um, and, and we have done some, some episodes on them in the past. And there's this thing that I find really interesting. They have this charter in their founding documents that says, our primary fiduciary duty is to humanity. And so contrasting <laughs> that kind of lofty goal, noble statement with like, well, but also it requires a lot of money to do this computing and it would be nice to get a return for our investment. Like it's, it's mind blowing to me that this particular organization is at the center of so much that is happening in AI right now and seems to be like a ball of contradictions wrapped up in itself. Yeah. I, Agree with you wholeheartedly on that. I mean, one of the things about OpenAI is that even though the mission is like, we're going to make sure AI is safe, they actually can take more risks than a Google or a Microsoft in the AI products they build, at least more reputational risks, because this is what they do, right? So so if you're Google and you're thinking about, you've built this amazing language model, you've built this chatbot called Lambda, that's probably, I mean, from what from what we know, it's probably every bit as good as ChatGPT, or at least in, you know, in the neighborhood. And you're thinking about whether to release that to the public. Well, it's not going to make you money anytime soon. It's probably a money loser. 
And if you release it to the public, there's all these examples of companies releasing AIs and it goes horribly wrong. Like I, maybe some people will remember Microsoft's Tay, which was this chatbot, this AI chatbot it came out with um, I don't know, five or eight years ago now. And it released it on social media and very quickly trolls taught it to like spout Nazi hate and racism and all the worst stuff of humanity. And Microsoft was like, oh, that's not good. And they had to pull it. Google has a lot to lose from something like that happening and not a ton, or at least they didn't see a ton to gain from releasing these tools to the public in the short term. But OpenAI comes along and these tools are all they do. There's no risk to the rest of their business. It's not like they're going to offend their enterprise cloud customers because they don't have any. And so even though their mission is all about safety, what really appealed to people in the AI field about working for them is that they could move faster. They could Hmm. worry less about their reputation. They could push out stuff to the public. And if it goes wrong, you know, they fix it. So they could they could just move faster and take more risks. And that enabled them to pull engineers away from companies like Google and Microsoft and Meta, where they're getting frustrated, like, okay, we're working on this stuff, but why can't we do anything with it? And why can't we, you know, why can't we let people use it? Well, an example of that seems to be that OpenAI is rolling out some sort of pro version of chat GPT for $42 a month. Some people seem to have that access. Like, they're trying things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's their that's their defining trait relative to the, to the big tech firms is that they try stuff. It's funny, they're called open AI. They've become, they've become quite closed in many ways. They don't tell anybody where their data comes from. Their models are, are you know, it's a relative black box. And then they don't answer questions, right? So they not only have they not confirmed what the terms of Microsoft's investment are, they wouldn't confirm to me, at least last time I tried them, that they are in fact rolling out the, the ChatGPT Pro at $42 hmm. a month. But, you know, you can see screenshots on Twitter. They're clearly at least testing the idea of, of rolling this out. So. I mean, I think the idea behind that may actually be more about the fact that their their tool, their free tool, is getting so popular that it's like over capacity all the time now. I tried to log into ChatGPT this morning, and what it does when you try to log in and it's at capacity is it like it'll it'll explain that it's over capacity in the voice of a pirate or like it'll like <laughs> write a haiku about why you can't use it right now. Yeah, it took me about four tries to get in today. Yeah, so that's happening more and more. So I think their idea there is if you want to be able to use it any time, you got to pay. And if, you, if you're just a free user, then you, know, you can use it when other people aren't using it. When we come back, why OpenAI has the rest of Silicon Valley freaking out? This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Chat GPT's popularity and the popularity of other consumer AI tools have made Silicon Valley pay attention. But perhaps no big company is as vulnerable to competition from AI startups as Google. Google faces at least two kinds of threats from this. One, which we've already alluded to, is losing its top AI talent to startups like OpenAI. And now there's all you know a whole bunch of other startups that are building on the tools of OpenAI and building on some of these models that, that are available. If Google doesn't respond and get back some of its AI mojo, 
it's not going to be able to attract and retain the top talent in the field anymore. But the other thing for Google, like a, a little bit further down the road, you start to worry about um, its search business, which is, you know, which is really at the core of its, of its business. I talked the other day to the CEO of a startup called Neva. He's a former Google executive who left the company because he was, you know, I think he was frustrated uh, about being able to make changes to Google search. And so he started a company that now does search uh, using large language models where you don't get links, you just get a response. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it doesn't always get it right. But for a lot of people, in a lot of cases, it might just be easier to ask a question and get an answer than to have to scroll through 10 different websites. Now, the, on the other end of that are the websites themselves. So there are more and more Google searches where the results turn up kind of low quality content that's just specifically designed to win that Google search. So if you search for like the best electric toasters in 2023, you'll get 10 websites that are all like specifically about the best toasters, <laughs> best electric toasters in 2023. But it takes you a while to get to consumer reports. Exactly. And so the, all this, all these sort of spammy sites have sprung up uh, to game Google's search engine, which makes the quality of its results worse. And I actually think that tools like ChatGPT are going to make it easier than ever to spin up a little spammy website. Like you may not even need to, to underpay a human anymore to make a toaster review site. You could just use ChatGPT to spit out some you know, fake reviews of toasters and win that Google search traffic. So as there's the, the potential for other search engines to use AI to get better, there's also the potential for the proliferation of the, these AI tools to make Google's own search worse. Well, is that why Sundar Pichai called this, you know, a, a code red? I mean, apparently calling in Larry Page and Sergey Brin, like this threatens their core business model. Yeah. And again, potentially, because I think that you know, I think the AI is not there yet. Um, and it's one of those, you know, it's one of those classic disruptive innovations, you know, for, for good and bad in the sense that the results you get from an AI may not be as good as Google. And that means that Google can't just switch its search engine to, to all be AI responses. I mean, it does, it does some of that when it's really confident, but Google would really suffer if it started just giving wrong answers <laughs> to people's questions. So it, it actually can't afford to move as aggressively in that direction as a startup could that's only using conversational AI instead of uh, you know, page ranking and and the sort of AI that Google uses. Google has also been riven by a lot of internal fights about AI and about the ethics of AI. Um, the engineer behind Lambda basically said it was sentient. That caused a lot of headlines. Before that, Timnit Gebru, who was one of the leaders of ethical AI within Google, was fired. It, it feels like there's a tremendous amount of conflict within Google about AI products and, and specifically about offering AI products to the masses. This is a tension that has been simmering inside Google for years now between the people who want to move fast and push the envelope like OpenAI is doing and the people who are are saying, wait, you know, let's let's not be evil. Um, let's make sure these tools aren't going to do harm. Let's think about all the ways they could go wrong. Let's slow down and not release stuff until we really understand um, what the impacts will be. And that risk calculus that the company has had around that may be changing now. I mean, with all the hype and with all the money pouring in, to AI and, and large language models and, and chatbots and such, it is going to face more pressure to stop listening to the Cassandras inside the company and start just getting more aggressive. Where do you see, I guess, kind of on that note, the risks of commercial AI rolling out for the masses? I mean, you've alluded to the fact that these things can be trained to be racist, can, you know, copy Nazis. Are they reliable? Like, what happens as this gets just disseminated? I think one of the biggest risks is people either not understanding or not caring what these tools are actually good at and what they aren't. So I, I talked to a, a source for a story a month or two ago uh, who called ChatGPT 
the world's greatest bullshitter. <laughs> I thought that, was, that really captured it. Like, it's fantastic at spitting out a plausible sounding response to anything you might ask. It's like the very best of the college English major who didn't read the book and can still get, you know, can still get a B on the essay. <laughs> um, and, and it's literally being used for that. Yeah, right? yeah. Like already college students are, are like, hey, I, I could probably try to bullshit this essay and get a C or I could let ChatGPT bullshit it for me and get a B. <laughs> But it's risky, Will says, to think about ChatGPT as an authoritative source of information. It's simply not. For all the hype about ChatGPT replacing Google, it would be really misguided to turn to ChatGPT for an answer to a question if you actually care whether the answer is right or wrong. I mean, it gets stuff wrong all the time. For example, I asked ChatGPT about the best treatments for endometriosis, a common disease that I happen to have. Its answer was only middling, still listing outdated medications. And so if you uh, are making any kind of decision based on something ChatGPT told you, that is a very bad idea. And that's, that's one of the obvious ways it can go wrong. Another way is, again, people who don't care, right? Like, so if you are trying to run, orchestrate a propaganda campaign on social media or a harassment campaign on social media, you could fine-tune a version of this model that's basically a propaganda machine that can spit out hate or abuse or propaganda or whatever message you want to get out there way more cheaply and faster and efficiently than any human could. There are bots, obviously, today that run propaganda campaigns, but they are mostly like cut and paste, right? They say stuff that that, that they're all... It's like a thousand bots all saying the same thing. Now you could have a thousand bots all saying different things on the same theme. It would be much harder to tell that they're bots. Um, I think that's almost certainly going to happen if it isn't happening already. There's an interesting question of responsibility when you get into the ethics of consumer AI. A startup like OpenAI isn't a public company. It doesn't face the same kind of accountability pressures that a Google or a Meta or any company with shareholders does. So what does that mean for Microsoft when its investment is powering OpenAI's work? Also, the money to be made in consumer AI might be seductive for the big players, especially in a moment where tech companies are laying people off and trying to figure out their next move. That again gets into the different positions of the startups and the tech giants. I think, at least for now, it's really going to be the startups that are willing to push the envelope on safety, on responsibility, on potential harms, because they don't have this this broader business to worry about. But we're also in a time in the tech world when all the giants are struggling a bit to one degree or another. I mean, they're still making <laughs> piles of money. I shouldn't say they're struggling. They're not growing as much as they want. They don't to, have right? a next and, hot thing. Yeah. I mean, that's it. That's partly it. Like they don't, they don't have something that's capturing the zeitgeist. They're, they're looking for that big new thing that's going to do what mobile did and what the cloud did 10 or 15 years ago and just, you know, spawn a whole generation of new, exciting tools and business lines. They're kind of desperate for that. And they think AI could be that. And at the same time, they're laying people off left and right because the the online ads business is down. And, And so they're in a time when they are more willing than before to take risks Hmm. because their core business isn't like, as long as you were minting money with what you were already doing, why try something new and risky? But if suddenly the, the money minting machine that is, you know, Google search or, you know, Facebook ads or whatever it may be slows down, then, you know, damaging that minting machine with something by trying something new starts to look more feasible. For all the conversations about ethical AI and doing this the right way, it's possible that any previous nervousness a company might have had about pushing boundaries could get swept aside. I was talking with Timnit Gebru. You mentioned her. She was a a researcher at Google who was forced out because she was warning of the harms of these large language models. I was talking with her the other day about this this question. I was saying, well, do you think that, 
now that they're under pressure from Microsoft and OpenAI, do you think Google will stop caring so much about safety and responsibility and just push stuff out? And she laughed. She was like, they never really cared about safety and responsibility. I mean, obviously, you know, Tim has, has an understandably dim view of, of Google, of Google. Uh, at this point. But she's like, they, they never really cared about that stuff. They cared about their reputation, right? Mm. They cared about bad press. They cared about a backlash hurting their business. She said, so... You know, I wouldn't put it as like they're going to stop caring about being responsible. You could ask if they're going to care a little bit less about the reputational risk. Maybe I'm a cynic, but it's hard not to notice that it feels like a lot of the same people, and I'm just going to say a lot of the same dudes who were hyping crypto as something that was going to revolutionize the world a year ago or 18 months ago, are now saying the same thing about AI. Is that unfair? Am I am I too cynical? I think that's just a fact. Like, I don't think, I think that's indisputable, right? Like all the tech bros who couldn't shut up about crypto a year ago can't shut up about AI today. But all I would add is that like that in itself doesn't mean that they're they're wrong this time. Uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, like even a tech bro can be right once in a while. Um, the experts I talk to are more mixed on AI. I mean, when I was talking to people about crypto who were like really smart, I think thoughtful people in the tech field who understood how crypto worked, even at the time of the maximum hype, a lot of them were telling me this whole thing is is you know, a scam. This is a house of cards. It doesn't do anything useful. All it does is financialize stuff so that you can make pyramid schemes and the whole thing's going to collapse. Like if you talk to the right people, that was close to a consensus view even a year ago. And they've, you know, they've now all been basically proven right. I would say today, like there are some people who think that it's really being overhyped and that, you know, chat GPT is mostly a clever toy and text to image is like a fun novelty that maybe will like make some difference on the margins, but it's not going to change society. These are not thinking machines. They're just really good at tricking us by sounding like humans. And in two years, we'll all be talking about something else. But there are also other really smart, thoughtful people who are like, no, look, AI is something that has been building in influence and importance for years. It is like the foundational technology here will be impactful in various ways, even if we don't know what those are. And even if the hype is not entirely justified or we're hyping the wrong aspects of it, this technology matters and is a big deal and is going to change a lot of aspects to life uh, of life in the years to come. It's not lost on me in this conversation that that OpenAI's kind of founding mission, they said, was to halt runaway AI from falling into the wrong hands. And yet here we are talking about runaway AI kind of carpet bombing the market and that that might lead to less safe AI being disseminated among the general public. I don't know how to think about that tension. I wonder if you've thought about it at all. I have, and I don't have an answer, but it is fascinating. I mean, in in some ways, it's like, it's kind of like a timeless human story. Like, it's, it's the person who, who wants to be the hero and save the world from this dangerous power. But to do that, they have to take over the power themselves. And like, you know, inevitably, it, you know, it, it threatens to corrupt them and turn them into the evil thing they were trying to fight to start with. Now, that may, may be giving, giving OpenAI way too much credit, right? I mean, there's a view of, of this in which all of the, the talk about saving humanity was really just like a very clever marketing scheme for a company that was, you know, that just wanted to build awesome AI stuff and, and, and make money. But even if they were sincere, you have to wonder, like, how do you save the world from runaway AI by advancing AI? Like, can you fight for peace by going to war, right? I think it, it's fascinating. It, it will be fascinating to see how it plays out and to see some of the, the, their original mission, like whether they try to stick to it and justify it in various ways or whether they kind of let it fall by the wayside, kind of like Google sort of quietly retired the, the don't be evil motto somewhere along the way. Will Remus, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Good talking to you. Will Remus is a reporter for The Washington Post covering technology. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. 
Our show is edited by Tori Bosch. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you're a fan of this show, I have a little request for you. Join Slate Plus. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. You get all your Slate podcasts ad-free. All right, we will be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. <laughs>